The nature of the American anti-war movement was one denoted not only by opposition to an external war, but one which suffered from a constant internal conflict for control and influence. The visions of conflicting factions consistently found themselves in opposition to one another, while attempting to independently guide a disunited movement towards the goal of ending a war. A goal which was ultimately achieved, therefore cementing the impact of the movement in 20th century history as not only a termination of American involvement in the Vietnam War, but also as a popularization of wartime opposition and protest against the government. Organizations and individuals within the anti-war movement took a previously fringe concept of opposition to the Vietnam War and actively engaged with its normalization. Yet, through disunity and internal clashes, the anti-war movement was partially responsible for popularization of law and order ideologies and movements such as the Nixonian Silent Majority. Therefore, the moderate faction of the American anti-war movement had a significant impact in organizing and growing opposition to the Vietnam War, despite internal disunity provoked by the radical faction. This is presented through the three major phases of the American anti-war movement, in which there were initial normalization of opposition, the period of disunity, and the ultimate push towards retraction of American troops. A vast majority of the U.S. population supported the Vietnam War prior to popularization of anti-war organizations, seeking to normalize opposition to the conflict. According to a Gallup poll conducted in July 1965, only 24% of Americans asserted that the Vietnam War was a mistake, while the majority 60% of the sample argued that they supported the war in Vietnam. During this period, anti-war organizations formed not as an independent activist groups, but within student coalitions that retained various goals, such as civil rights advancement, free speech support, anti-Cold War promotion, and more specifically, anti-Vietnam War activism. This allowed for the anti-war faction to unite with similarly oriented students and form an initial base of support within the universities. One such example was the reorganization of the Students for a Democratic Society, or SDS, in favor of anti-war activism as opposed to a broadly leftist students group movement. An anti-war activist named Bill Zimmerman asserts that this initial period was defined by two central motivations for the movement, which were to give activists enough knowledge about the Vietnam War to be able to draw others into action and to normalize opposition, since many Americans were hesitant to oppose their own country in a time of war. The former goal of educating activists regarding the Vietnam War would allow more members of the anti-war movement to act independently of any sort of central leadership, permitting increased capacity for libertarian and grassroots initiatives and promotion, making use of educational tactics such as training seminars for volunteers and teach-ins, of which there were 120 across the United States from March March 1965 to June 1965. This was the step which permitted for the reorientation of various students' organizations around the more pointed initiative of anti-war protest. Furthermore, this mass education through peaceful methods allowed the anti-war movement to make crucial advances towards the goal of normalizing public outcry against the Vietnam War. By permitting promotion through those it educated, it gave the movement a more naturally organized and widespread feel, despite having a quite small membership at the time. Additionally, the rhetoric used by the anti-war movement and their activists was initially accompanied by moderate demonstration tactics intended to cement their image as a peaceful and relatable movement. The use of these strategies generated immense growth in the movement's recognition by the mass public, 
fueling an expansion beyond the restrictive bounds of the university campuses. Organizations such as SDS and SANE were organizing public protests through lawful means and achieving contemporaneously monumental turnouts of approximately 20,000 participants. Yet, this growth and educational methods and incorporation of various subgroups within the anti-war movement often occurred at the expense of fragmentation within the movement. The education techniques taught members not only the facts surrounding the Vietnam War, but also how to organize independent and unsanctioned events and opposition. Accompanied by the introduction of more radical subgroups such as religious fanatics, hippies and yippies, the draft office burglary and arsons, many moderates seeking to join the movement watched in distaste. Yet, the radical faction of the anti-war movement was mostly outside of Central Command until 1968. Anti-war advocacy from individuals such as Robert Kennedy, the New York Times columnist Walter Lippmann, and Senator J. William Fulbright were sufficient to prolong the period of growth for the anti-war movement. Despite clergymen pouring blood onto draft cards and the Youth International Party, or Yippies, attempting to levitate the Pentagon building. At the height of this period of relative unity within the movement, a New York protest against the Vietnam War garnered 500,000 demonstrators, signifying the largest public protest in modern American history. However, such an enormous collective of anti-war organizations and individuals was practically guaranteed to encounter a bout of disunity and internal conflict. The anti-war movement experienced such a decline following the tumultuous years of 1967 and 1968. On October 21, 1967, a demonstration of 100,000 individuals at Washington, D.C.'s Lincoln Memorial broke apart as 50,000 of the more radical participants proceeded towards an unsanctioned march on the Pentagon building. Organized attacks against induction centers occurred in Berkeley, California, and New York City, NY. Therefore, the pacifist aspects, which the majority of Americans has, had associated with a more normalized anti-war movement, dissipated, as did much of the popular support from which the movement had been prospering. A stagnation visibly demonstrated in the Vietnam hawk and dove polling statistics from 1968 until early 1970. The usurpation of the moderate leadership of the anti-war movement, in exchange for the unsustainable ruling for the radical minority, negatively impacted and delayed development of anti-war initiatives. The disunity and militant rhetoric of the anti-war movement during this period served as an internal conflict which prevented organizations from adequately tackling the external issues which were the Vietnam War and normalizing its opposition. Unfortunately, this conflict was one which the movement would never truly escape, directly resulting in the dissolution of the SDS in 1969, after which components of the leadership formed the Weathermen, a disgraced group which engaged in improvised blasts of various targets around the United States. It is a logical conclusion to think that this internal conflict and militancy both scared potential members away while simultaneously emboldening the more moderate opposition, such as the Nixonian Silent Majority, who claimed to be a moderate pro-law and order group behind the Republican candidate Nixon. As compared to the radical candidate Hubert Humphrey in 1968 for the Democrats, despite his pro-war political platform similar to that of the Johnson administration and his moderate take on democratic politics, due to his affiliation with the divided Democratic Party in which there were various anti-war candidates for the primary, 
He was branded as a radical socialist and communist by Republican political organizations due to policies which were not his own. In 1968, the Democratic presidential candidate was only capable of winning 12 of the 50 United States plus the District of Columbia. Additionally, disunity caused by the radical faction of the anti-war movement did not cease following an improvement of the cause's popularity. After the Pentagon Papers were leaked, the lack of popularity towards Nixon's administration did not adequately translate into reciprocal popularity for the anti-war movement, since the radical faction was still in charge, and many of the involved organizations refused to cooperate properly. An organizational coup against the leadership took place in organizations around the country, uniting under more moderate methods, opting as they did originally for the use of demonstration and protest tactics rather than active resistance. Various anti-war organizations refused to support more drastic slogans, which had been popularized in the years 1968 and 1969, including the 1969 slogan, One Side's Right, One Side's Wrong, Victory to the Viet Cong, for which many anti-war activists had been accused of Marxist and communist affiliations, something which was the case only among a small group of radicals representing a vocal minority of the movement. Although the disunity formed by disobedient radical factions of the anti-war movement remained throughout the 1970s, it lost much of its support and power within the movement. However, certain negative effects associated with the practices of radical anti-war individuals continued to present themselves politically, since the anti-war movement's mass support was still experiencing a slow revitalization in the early 1970s, it could not provide a full thrust for anti-war Democratic candidate George McGovern in the presidential election of 1972. Furthermore, although the anti-war public affiliation was rebounding, it had not fully ridded itself of the radical stigma most prominent in the late 1960s. Further debilitating the candidacy of anti-war Democratic nominee, McGovern, who stood by more extreme policies such as amnesty for those who had illegally dodged the draft. Nixon's Republican Party had once again won a vast majority of states during the 1972 election, presenting himself as a moderate, contrary to the fanatically leftist anti-war movement resulting in George McGovern only winning his home state of Massachusetts, as well as the District of Columbia in one of the worst Democratic Party losses and worst anti-war losses in American history. Additionally, this political credibility lent from the radical wing of the anti-war movement to the Republican-Nixon administration, then allowed it to engage in further escalation of the war in Vietnam implementing Operation Linebacker 2, which then oversaw the carpet blasting of the North Vietnamese capital of Hanoi, whilst the actions of the more moderate faction of the anti-war movement oversaw a positive argument against the Vietnam War on moral and economic grounds, the radical wing of the movement directly slowed progress, while the Republican government of the United States expanded immoral military action against the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Yet, the moderates did eventually significantly overshadowed the failed radical leadership through the initiation of multiple crucial organizations such as the Indochina Peace Campaign and Medical Aid for Indochina, both of which engaged in significant and tremendous amounts of anti-war activism, which was critical to termination of the Vietnam War, effectively making use of documents such as the Pentagon Papers and encouraging an exposition through more mainstream media to renormalize affiliation with the anti-war movement, famously gaining approval through the victorious New York Times Co. vs. United States Supreme Court case, in which it was found unconstitutional that the Nixon administration attempted to silence media outlets such as the New York Times and Washington Post. 
In a conflict on the basis of morality and narrative, the moderate wing of the anti-war movement made the most progress through effectively exposing the wrongdoings and secrets within the government and presenting itself as a viable and mainstream alternative to the status quo, something which the radical faction in favor of active resistance was fundamentally incapable of doing as a result of their more extreme methods. Moreover, the mid-70s saw the more prominent encouragement of Vietnam veterans to speak out against the state-sponsored atrocities which were occurring on the Indo-Chinese Peninsula, with many American GIs publicly denouncing the war in Vietnam and proclaiming their support for the anti-war movement. The collective backlash against the Nixon administration, alongside growing majority support for the more moderate anti-war movement, generated a severe decline in political appetite for the war, both outside and within the White House. Despite having been re-elected with a significant margin over the Democratic presidential candidate George McGovern one year prior, the Nixon administration was forced to shift its rhetoric soon after the election. Due to significant external pressures and a harshly declining presidential approval rating in late 1972, the Republican caucus and President Nixon increasingly opted for the appearance of cooperation through treaties such as the Paris Peace Accords in 1973, in a desperate attempt to regain popularity amid significant criticism from the anti-war movement and allegations of corruption in the Watergate scandal. The Nixon administration agreed to withdraw troops from Vietnam according to the Paris Peace Accords, although the fall of the Nixon administration cannot be credited to the anti-war movement, but rather the internal corruption of the Nixon administration, such as Watergate, the pro-war movement did experience significantly decreasing popularity due to its affiliation with Nixon. While the anti-war movement was now capable of demonstrating itself to be a viable and mainstream alternative to the administration of President Nixon, therefore resulting in the collapse of American involvement in the Vietnam War as of January 27, 1973, and the fall of the American-backed Republic of Vietnam on April 30, 1975, since the military effort was unsustainable in the absence of international backing. It can additionally be said that an impact of the anti-war movement was the collapse of the corrupt South Vietnamese regime, as well as increased ability of the American public to protest during times of war. Therefore, despite significant divisions, unfavorable methods of opposition from the radical wing of the anti-war movement, and a nature of internal conflict within the movement, it was capable of destigmatizing opposition during times of war, while also provoking an end to American involvement in the Vietnam War. Furthermore, the absence of the American military presence in the Indo-Chinese Peninsula transformed a stagnant war effort into one considered completely unsustainable, for the fragile Republic of Vietnam, which soon collapsed. Yet, through the movement's internal hardships, it demonstrated the increased effectiveness of peaceful protest tactics as compared to the more aggressive disruption tactics, which prioritized small preventative successes over the larger narrative and public image they were establishing inspiring increased awareness of the positive effect which media spin can have on a movement and or organization, collectively occurring in a pattern of gradual forward and backward progression for the anti-war cause, resulting in the end of the Vietnam War. If you enjoyed this video, please check out those like and subscribe buttons down there. And in the description, we also have some further readings if you're interested in the topic. Have a great day. Bye.